Christ is in our midst. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Melissa. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. It's been a wild uh, ride uh, the last couple of years. Lots of travel, lots of <laughs> lots of you know crazy conversations with people. Lots of questions, lots of pushback, lots of learning about the needs of people. Lots I think about of learning about ourselves, getting to know you better. You know, and I value your, your friendship and I value everything you bring to the church too. So, thanks for thanks for you know letting me come here and kind of like spout at everybody for a couple of minutes. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's a blessing. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's been a really fantastic time. The bar is, like, really high over the course of the last couple of days. If I fail to clear it, I ask for your forgiveness, uh, you know, right from the advance. Let's moderate expectations, and if we're pleasantly surprised, that's a fantastic thing. Um, so uh, I, I kind of want to take a step back, like Melissa implied, and just sort of look at things from kind of a big-picture perspective, maybe have a couple of thoughts to wrap everything up, um, and we can get into a couple of things if you want to unpack anything a little bit more during uh, questions. So um, I, I tend to speak quickly. If I go too quickly, like wave your hands at me. Um, I might wave my hands back at you too because I tend to be very orchestral when I speak as well. So I'll try. I'll try to keep it. I'll try to keep it. I'll try to keep it helpful. Um, I really want to start though with um, a couple of stories, um, or kind of two stories, um, as we help think about this. Um, one of them is uh, real. And one of them is made up. And uh, I think it'll be helpful for us to think about the difference between which one is real and which one is made up. And uh, hopefully this can be kind of like a, a prism through which we can begin thinking about these questions of, of ministry, of, of reimagining ministry, of th- thinking about wrestling with you know, what it's for, um, why we do it, and what that means for us, for our families, for our communities, uh, for our kids, for ourselves. So first story. Could be real, could not be real. You will decide. Um, during one of our beach treats, an anguished father came up, um, I think during lunch, and was just sharing some of his difficulties, right? Some of his uh, younger kids were at the retreat. Um, he had, I think, one older kid that had either just graduated college or was kind of late in college. And he was just sort of like talking about how much you know, fun his kids were having at the retreat and how thankful he was. And he just sort of paused at one point and then started talking about his oldest son, who had you know, graduated from Goya, did all the things, went off to college, and hadn't been to church in months at that point and had no inkling of really going back. And he just kind of like is sharing some of his son's challenges and sort of twists and turns and what may or may not have caused him to fall away and he just kind of looked at me with pain in his eyes and he said like Steve what the heck do we do to keep our kids in church I've lost one already I've got two more on the way like what what do we do and you you, you could see the just the, the pain and the fear in his voice you know like it cracked as he's like what do we do to keep our kids in church could be real could be made up Another one. Uh, during a different beach treat, a mother comes up to me with pain in her eyes, right? We were, in, um, we were in the New England area at this point. And she looks at me and she's like, you know what? There's just, there's something that's really deeply important to me and my family. And this has been something that's been so formative to the way that we live, live our lives as, as a family. Um, my son just graduated high school and he's going off uh, to New York. And, uh, you know, we're Patriots fans. And I am terrified that he's going to go into jet country and that he's going to come up back a Jets fan in a couple of months. And, uh, you know, I can't, I don't know, I don't know what I would do with myself if that ever happened. Like, Steve, how do I keep my kid a New England Patriots fan? Could be real, could be made up. Uh, I imagine you have a sense of which one's the real story and which one's the made up story, right? Um, I have heard, as probably have you, Hundreds of times, thousands of times, the question of how do we keep our kids in the church? I've never heard a person ask, how do I keep my kids fan of favorite sports team? Never ask that question, right? Because think about it. From the time a child is little, we dress them in the right colors. We make the pilgrimage once a week, or maybe even more, to the sacred space where the holy athletic contest is done. We talk every morning, we read the news, and we cheer when our chosen team does well, and we sometimes weep when our chosen team does not do well. 
We obsessively memorize names and statistics and facts and figures, and we never have to sort of convince our kids to be fans of whatever team because it's just deeply ingrained in their hearts. You know, you can grow up a Patriots fan and go to college in New York. No way you're ever going to be a Jet fan. You can go to college in Miami. No way you're ever going to become a Dolphins fan. No way. But yet for some reason, kids grow up in the church and they go off to our godless secular universities, right? Which isn't actually the problem, but that's how we frame the problem because we'd rather shift the blame to somebody else. They go off to the godless secular universities and they come back and they're not Christians anymore. How do we keep our kids in church? Maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe that's the wrong question. So sports and other kind of cultural things, I think, do a fantastic job of actually forming the next generation, right? So I want to zoom in a little bit and kind of try to put my kid hat back on. And because we're talking about family ministry, right? Children are sort of at the core of family ministry. I kind of want to share some stories from me when I was a kid and some of the things that explicitly or implicitly helped shape and form my expectations of what the church is and what ministry is. Um, And again, keep some of those comments about like sports in mind as I share some of these stories. Uh, They're all obviously very personal stories. They're not scientific. They're very idiosyncratic. Uh, But the more I share them, the more I realize there are some common themes that might resonate. So if I'm totally off base, forgive me. Uh, If there's something that resonates, again, we can talk about that. So story one, a relatively early memory that I have of being in the church Um, I think I was in like, I think I was like five or six. I think I was in kindergarten or first grade in Sunday school at that point. And it was just a, for whatever reason, a well-attended Sunday. It wasn't a holiday or anything. It was just a well-attended Sunday, which happens sometimes, right? Maybe, Maybe there was a memorial. That's generally why people go to church, right? Not for Jesus, but for the other stuff. Um... Not that I'm bitter about that or anything. Um, And so I'm like this kid, and, you know, I'm I'm surrounded by my classmates, and we're getting into line for Holy Communion. And I'm just looking around because I'm a kid, and my attention span is whatever. And I look up, and I see, you know, so many adults, grown-ups, taking kids to the chalice. And sometimes they look like their parents, and sometimes they look like maybe their grandparents, and sometimes they look like maybe their godparents because they've got the candles, Right? I see all these adults taking these kids up to the chalice, and, you know, they'll present the kid, kid will receive, priest will turn to the adult, adult's like, I'm cool, and keeps walking. And time and again, right, I look and I see this, and then I look around in my line, and I see that, like, there's the babies that get sent up, there's the Sunday school kids that get sent up, and then there's just not a lot of other adults who are in line, and the adults who are in line politely refuse, So I have this thought as, you know, like I kind of pause for a second and the kid behind me pushes me because I'm holding up the line. And it's like, is communion for kids? Not an explicit lesson, right? But my little brain was working and that's, I think, a reasonable conclusion. Another story uh, from a couple of years later. I think by this point I was, I think, in like second or third grade. And the way we did things in in, uh, Sunday school in my home parish was every grade had like a pew. So the first pew in the very front was the pre-K kids, and then the pew behind was the kindergarten kids, and then first grade, and then second grade, so all all the way through. And I'm kind of in the middle of the pack at this point. And I look ahead at the squirmy little kindergartners, and and it's just the pew is packed with kids, right? There's like, they're literally like it's a fire code violation. There's just so many over there. And there's just kind of a few less in the kindergarten pew, and there's like a few less in the first grade pew, and there's a few less in the second grade pew. And I kind of look to my left and right in my pew, and I look over my shoulder, and the crowd just sort of gets thinner and thinner as we get to eighth grade, because the the Sunday school stopped at eighth grade in my parish because we just didn't have any kids for more Sunday school after that. And then it's like, so it's like you get seventh grade, There's like a smattering, eighth grade, there was three or four kids, and then just gray hairs, as far as the eye can see, behind. And I'm thinking about this, and I look ahead of me, and I see all the kids, and I look behind me, and I see this kind of hard stop in the progression, right? And I'm like, what happens to me when I hit ninth grade or college? 
You know, communion's for kids. Maybe church is for kids and old people. Not an explicit lesson, right? But implicit lesson. Another lesson. I was at uh, Goya, which in my parish was basically basketball, um, and uh, as it is in a lot of parishes, I think. And we were, you know, we were messing around at the very beginning. We were just shooting, like, impossible half-court shots and doing ridiculous, like, pretending we're hook shots and, like, whatever, the stupid things kids do when they're messing around. And then, uh, like, the Goya leader comes in, and he gathers us all together, and he's like, guys, 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 come on, a second. We just, we have to play, we have to pray, and then we'll get back to the fun stuff. I'm like, hmm. We have to pray so that we can get to the fun stuff. Prayer is really boring, isn't it? And it's this thing we wouldn't really do if we didn't have to do. Okay, put my head down, waited 10 seconds to do our prayer, and then we got back to the fun stuff. Not an explicit lesson. Again, implicit lesson. My sort of kid brain was just trying to make sense of the world. Another example. This time, I think I was, I was like 13 years old, and I went to the baptism of a cousin in the family, and then we go to, you know, like the hall where the, the meal happens afterwards, and uh, everybody sort of stands up, and uh, the priest was there, and he sort of does the blessing, and he says these very unfamiliar words, very unfamiliar words, but they came with a very familiar cadence. So the priest starts saying, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I'm like thinking about this, like I recognize that tune, right? I recognize the way that's said. And then it dawns on me, and I lean over to my cousin, and I say, is that the Paterimon? And she says, yeah. I was like, it comes in English? <laughs> Seriously. And I don't know what's sadder about the story, the fact that I was 13 and I didn't know that the Paterimon came in English, or that I recognized it because of the really bored way that we always say it. Not an explicit lesson. Implicit lesson. My little kid brain was just trying to make sense. Final story. So I get to the end, right? I'm in eighth grade. At the end of eighth grade, uh, Sunday school. Uh, I graduated, right? We've got our little robes on. We've got our, semin- uh, our, um, our uh, ceremony. And, uh, I, you know, I go up and I get my diploma and I shake hands and we're all lined up and we're taking pictures. And, you know, they're, they're talking about how we've, you know, finished our journey and so forth and we've graduated. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, finished my journey? Like, this is it? There's nothing more to the spiritual life? Like, I'm done? I, like, I'm a cert- certificated, certified, whatever? Like, this is way lamer than advertised. <laughs> this is way lamer than advertised. Like, I'm done? There's no way I'm done. Not, I mean, maybe that was more of an explicit lesson, but there was, I think, strong sort of implications that were there. Maybe I had a particularly weird upbringing. Again, the more that I share these stories, though, I see a lot of chuckles. I see a lot of sort of heads nodding. Uh, even if the details of the story might differ, I feel like there are some universal threads that we can at least talk about maybe later during the Q&A. So, I don't know. I raise it as a uh, thought. I, my... Again, these are implicit lessons, right? It's, we don't go out there and try to like, explicitly tell kids that Jesus doesn't matter, and we don't go out there and explicitly tell kids that when you get to be a young adult, you don't have to worry about it. And you know, We don't tell kids explicitly these things, but in my own life anyway, and I think in the lives of many young adults out there, I picked up a lot of implicit lessons, um, you know, that religion is something you can outgrow or even graduate from, that uh, church is something that gets in the way of life. Church is this thing that we sort of have to do because we have to, and then we get back to the stuff we actually want to do. Um, that Christ is meant to be distant and un- incomprehensible. That um, we're more concerned with the what's of religious observance than the why of actually encountering the crucified and risen Lord. No one told me that explicitly, right? But as I connected the dots in my own head, and as I sort of look back on my life, those are the implicit lessons that I, at least, drew. And I think that that that, that what's piece is really important as well, because it seems to me that the what's of ministry and the what's of the church have really, like, exploded over the years, you know? 
We've got, we've got so much stuff as, as more, you know, works are being translated into English and, you know, there's more sort of like events and there's more programs and there's more retreats and there's more videos and there's more podcasts and there's more curricula and there's more books and there's more pamphlets and there's yada, 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 right? And like all of this, this mountain of stuff. Um, but in my life, certainly, in the, in the lives of many young people who grow up in the church, what happens at the top of this mountain of stuff, this mountain of ministry stuff is not some sort of Taboric encounter, not some sort of Taboric vision of the uncreated light, but rather quite the opposite. Um, And I think it's worth talking about why that is. We've really doubled down on the what's and maybe forgot about the why, which has shaped the way we do the what's. Um, So I want to now actually form another point of contrast, and I want to look at some companies because we live in a consumer culture, but we're not born consumerists, right? We're kind of formed into it. So I'm very curious to think about the way that some companies, some brands, actually create a sort of loyalty that we would kill for in the church. So um, again, for the point of comparison, another prism through which to look, let's maybe think about this. Here's a one that is certainly very um, familiar to everybody, right? Uh, I have a, an iPhone in my pocket, and I'm doing this presentation off of a MacBook, and I've got two iPads at home, so I'm like totally on team. I'm on totally on team uh, Apple at this point. Uh, they recently uh, put out a in their like financial filings. They've got 261.5 billion dollars in cash assets, which is just a ridiculous amount of money. Like they can afford to buy everybody that's on, that works for them, like a Learjet or something. Like it's it's a crazy amount of money. So they're really good at what they do. They're really good at what they do. Um, but you think about it. So I've got an iPhone in my, in my, um, in my pocket. Uh, for, on a purely sort of technical level, when it comes to the resolution of the screen, when it comes to the features, when it comes to the quality of the phone, the, you know, the camera, whatever it is, like, are the specs of this really that much different from a Samsung or an HTC or whatever it is? Just like purely out like in terms of the what. This is a computing device that accesses the internet and does a couple of like fun little tricks. Is it really that much different than other little computing devices that access the internet and do a couple of like fun little tricks? Like in terms of just like pixel resolution and you know bandwidth speed and stuff like that. Forgive me, Jamil, if I'm like misusing tech words over here. Uh, <laughs> ones and zeros. Um, it, like, is it really that much different than other phones? Or is like a laptop like this really that much better than other laptops? And yet I paid more for this phone than other kinds of comparable phones, and I paid more for this laptop than other comparable laptops, and so many of us paid more for our Apple products that they are literally sitting on a mountain of $261.5 billion in cash and cash assets. Um, even though they're not necessarily better at what they do, right? Better at the sort of products they make. But, like, this is people lining up to get the new iPhone. I think this was, like, when the 5 or the 6 came out. This is the line, right, on the first day that it came out. So not only do people, like, pay a premium for these products, they are willing to sacrifice many, many hours of their time to be the first ones. Like, look, this is the line. It's just one guy just videotaped from the beginning to the end. This is the line in London at the Apple Store, like, when, when it first came out. I've never seen a line that long out of, outside of church. Never. <laughs> never. There, so there's the end. It's a long line. Or now, like, the new uh, Apple 10 was just, or the iPhone 10 was just announced, right? And again, like, people are saying that, uh, you know, it's got the sort of end-to-end screen, and it kind of, like, is mimicking other products that already exist, and others did the face recognition first. But you know what? People are already pre-ordering this thing, for the low, low price of $1,000. People are going to pay $1,000 for this little computational device, for the privilege of owning this computational device, as opposed to comparable ones, right? We give away the kingdom of God for free every Sunday, and there's no way that there's this amount of enthusiasm for that. Why? Why? What's, what's their secret? Second one, Harley-Davidson. Another brand, right? They, um, they're known for their sort of very rabid customer loyalty. Um, 
you know, people like love their Harleys and they've got like, you know, there's a whole thing, right? There's a, entire groups of people who will go around and like take trips together and there's all this like this fellowship and this community and then like, you know, they wear the Harley jackets and they'll sort of like, it's this, it's this thing. It's like a thing for people. Um, but again, from a purely like technical spec perspective, are their motorcycles like faster than other motorcycles? Are the seats more comfortable than other motorcycles? Um, not necessarily, like just on a pure engineering point of view, not necessarily. But you see people wearing like with Harley Davidson tattoos. You don't see people with like Yamaha tattoos. You know, again, why? Why is that? What's the what's the difference? Um, why is why why is there this 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 incredible sort of like connection that people have to these particular brands? Connection that we don't see with other more important aspects of our lives. Well, for me, the helpful way to think about this is an insight that uh, Simon Sinek, who's people have probably seen his TED talk, right? He um, has this really easy to understand, simple framework that he talks about in this book. Start with why, right? And um, it's 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 a helpful way to think about the difference between a compelling vision and an uncompelling vision, um, what it is that actually moves people. And he does a very deep analysis in terms of like the way the brain works and so forth. So if you want to dig into it a little bit more, I'd, I'd recommend the book. It's quite good. Um, but I'll give you kind of like the, the key nugget that he takes away. He has this idea of the golden circle, right? And the golden circle answers three basic questions. One more. Why, how, and what, right? The magic happens depending on the order in which we answer these questions, right? His basic hypothesis is that most of the brands that are out there are basically commodities. Like a computer company sells computers. They focus on their what, right? You buy uh, an Acer, you buy an HP, you buy whatever it is, like they focus on the what. A company like Apple, on the other hand, focuses on something different. They start with why, as the title uh, goes. Um, and that, and that leads to something that is incredibly um, different because, like, you know, we, one, of, one of the examples that he tells in the book is, uh, like, when, when, uh, when Martin Luther King gave his, uh, you know, his famous uh, I Have a Dream speech, like, there's a reason that it wasn't an I Have a Plan speech, right? There's a reason that he spoke about vision, and it's that vision that connected with people. And there's a reason that companies that have some sort of vision of the good life that tend to connect with people because one of his takeaway lessons is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Because if you're in the computer business, for instance, and all you're looking as a, consu as a consumer is to buy a computer, you're going to buy the one that's on sale, you're going to buy the one that's cheapest, right? You're not going to have any connection to a particular brand. Like, if I want a shirt, I'm just going to go for the one that has the best cotton and is the most affordably priced, right? But we don't do that very frequently. We go to like a particular brand of shirt. We go to a particular brand of jeans because again, there's a vision that's given out here. So like think again of Apple. Um, there's two ways that Apple could go about selling their products. Remember those th three questions, right? Why, how, and what. Apple could say, what? We've got some really awesome computers. How? We designed them to be very um, consumer friendly and easy to use. Why? Because we believe in simplicity of design and we beca because we believe in unlocking the potential of individuals. Do you want to buy one? But they don't do it that way, right? They don't start with their computers. Like, they start with their motto, think different. We are a company that believes in originality. We are a company that believes in creativity. We are a company that believes in unleashing the potential that is in each and every human life. We are a company that believes in thinking differently because there is something within you that needs to be unlocked. And that manifests in the way that we design our machines, because we design our machines to be sleek, to be beautiful, to be something that's easy to use, so that you can be you know, as productive um, and as accessible as you possibly can. Would you like to buy one? Like That's a totally different sales pitch, right? Because on the one hand, when you start with the what, it's just a commodity. I'm selling you a computer. But when you start with the why, you're giving somebody a vision of the good life, right? You're sort of connecting on, the, on like the level of values, originality, creativity, disruption, right? Do you see yourself as an original thinker? Do you see yourself as the sort of person who is a leader rather than a follower? Do you see yourself?
himself as the sort of person who rebels against the status quo and gives fresh ideas to the world, then you're really going to want one of our computers. And that's why, by the way, another cool thing that he mentions in the, uh, in the uh, book, like when you have your Mac product open, the logo faces outwards. Because when you buy a product like this, you are telling the world, I am an original thinker. I am a creative person. He contrasted it with like HP laptops. For the longest time, the HP logo, when you opened up your, logo, your uh, laptop, was upside down because it faced inward to the user. And he's like, that's, not, that's why people don't buy HP laptops with the same sort of rabid devotion that they buy Apple products. Because when you buy an HP laptop, you're buying a laptop. When you buy an Apple product, whatever it is that it might be, you're buying a lifestyle. You're saying something about the sort of person you want to be. And that's the reason why Apple, by the way, has gone from a company that's been a disruptive force in the computer industry to now the cell phone industry to the music industry with iTunes, right? I mean, like because they have this vision that people want to come along with. The same thing with Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson has this really interesting brand that is kind of their take on classic, rugged Americanness, right? It's about freedom. It's about the open road. It's about being that lone wolf that's on that dusty stretch of highway, right? You don't need anybody. You're out there. You're doing your thing. That's why one of their logos is, why buy a motorcycle when you can own a Harley? You're not simply buying a machine, right? You are an owner. You're an American, damn it, right? You get to own something, and it's this machine that's going to take you out to wherever you want to. You want to go to a music festival in the middle of the desert? You can go. You want to go down to your uh, local coffee shop to get your $7 cold brew, whatever. The, I don't know if Harley-Davidson people drink $7 cold brews, but you know what I mean, right? Why buy a motorcycle when you can own a Harley, that is the sort of like vision of the good life, right? These are the values that are implicit in that brand, and that's the reason why people will literally tattoo brands like that on, on their bodies, because it says something about who they are. And when you buy that sort of product, you are making this public statement about the sort of person that who you are. No one needs to nag you <laughs> into buying a Harley. No one needs to convince you into buying an iPhone. And yet I think the experience of growing up in the church is not that inspiring. We focus so often on the what. You have to go to church. You have to say your prayers. You have to do this. The what's, the what's, the what's. Do this, do this, do this. But I don't want to. You have to. Just shut up and do it. I'm tired. Doesn't matter. You're going to Sunday school. But I have other things to do. Doesn't matter. You're going to Goya. How many parents are out there like, but mom, I don't want an iPhone. Doesn't matter, you're getting an iPhone. Doesn't happen, right? Doesn't happen. But it's weird, right? Because it's also this, 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 this mixed message too because like we tell our kids so often, like you have to go to church even though you're probably going to stop when you're older, even though I drop you off to church events and don't actually participate myself, but you have to go to church. So again, there's that. That's why when I think of this ministry challenge, like, Scripture comes to mind, but in this negative sort of way, because, like I said before, we've got more stuff than ever. But at the top of this mountain of ministry stuff, we're not having this encounter with the risen Lord. We're not having the scales drop from our eyes and see the Lord for who he really is or see ourselves for who, who we really are. It's just kind of like layers of stuff. When I talk to kids so often, they think about their commitments to the church as just, just more to-do lists, right? Just more responsibilities, just more stuff that adds to their already stressful and anxious and depressed and whatever it is lives. You know, you, you, you tell people, you tell kids especially, like, this is what the church is. That's not what they see. You know, this, this, this vision of the, of, of the light of Tabor, that's not what people think about. That's not what they encounter at the top of this heap of stuff, unfortunately, Quite the opposite. And a lot of this starts with us, right? There's other scripture passages that come to mind, too. Um, there's the raising of the widow of Nain, for instance. And, you know, we can do all sorts of wonderful exegesis about this. There, a part that's interesting, though, that we sometimes don't focus on is the fact that, remember, widow, son, son died. Father was already dead. Father was already dead. One of, I think, the implicit lessons that is going on in this scripture is that 
The son, as many children do, took after his father. The son followed his father into death. If we are lukewarm, our children are going to follow us into lukewarmness. If we are dead, our children are going to follow us into death. Right? I think it's an important twist because I think a lot of, a lot of youth ministry is really about that, what we're actually passing on. And the sort of the dryness that is in our hearts is the dryness that is infecting our kids, and our kids don't have the sort of cultural inertia that might be pushing them into this the way that past generations might have. You know, because yeah, yeah, wants you to is not a conversation anymore. Or there's this, right, from Acts 20, when young Eutychus fell out the window, right? When Paul literally bored a kid to death. Remember that? Paul is giving this like long discourse and Eutychus is there sitting on the windowsill and he nods off just for a moment and he plummets out a window and he dies. Paul bored a kid to death. So if I'm boring you guys, I guess I'm in good company, right? Like there's, um, but that's the thing, right? Why was a young person like that sitting in such a precarious position to begin with? Because all it took was a momentary nod for that kid to plummet. Are we perching our kids precariously on windowsills at the outer edge of church life? Why wasn't Eutychus squarely in the middle of a warm and loving community? Did he not want to? Was he never invited? Was it never an option? He was in a dangerous position, and all it took was one of those. And I think we can think in our own lives about young people in our lives who are kind of on the fence, who are struggling with stuff, And maybe it takes just one bad situation, one harsh word from a priest, right? One unreturned call, one friend who's struggling with being gay, one friend who's struggling with self-harm, one biology class, right? Like evolution and so forth, right? One tiny little thing in the grand scheme of things could be enough to knock a young Eutychus out the window. So this is something that I obsess about. This is something I obsess about because, you know, there's, we don't really have any specific data about the Orthodox Church, but um, the, the, the dominant sort of like theme in American Christianity anyway seems to be that we lose about 60% of our young people, right? There's this really interesting study that was done by the Barna Group, You Lost Me, and it looks at um, religious engagement as people transition out of high school into early, young adulthood basically, right? And 60% of people who were committed when they were 15, disengage when they hit their 20s. You do get a little bit of a bounce because, you know, sometimes culturally they get married and they come back to the church for the wedding, even if they don't come back for anything afterwards, and maybe they'll baptize their kids, and, you know, little, you get a little bit of a bounce, but it's never, it's never a full return. For what it's worth, anecdotally, there's no really hard data to back this up, In my own life, I've done the math, 90% of the kids that I grew up with are gone. 90%. That includes, like, my cousins. That includes the kids that I played basketball with. That includes the kids at my parochial school. That includes, like, everybody that I grew up with. I just, at one point, as I was reading um, You Lost Me the first time, I just kind of started doing a mental roster. Um, And it's bad, (laughs) Sure, some of them now have gotten married in the church, and some of them have kids, and maybe they'll send their kids back to Sunday school, and maybe we'll have a little bit of a bounce, but that's pretty precipitous, right? That's a lot of Eutychuses falling out of a lot of windows. Eutychi? Eutychi, I don't know what the... (laughs) So, that conversation can be a little bit misleading by itself, though, because I think sometimes when we think about, like, the problem of connecting with young people, like, it's those dang millennials and there's their avocado toast, like, it's something about them in particular, um, it's just the current generation is really sort of disconnecting, um, and as Orthodox Christians in particular, we don't have a lot of data going back. Um, the one sort of big data point that we've had very recently is a census that the Assembly of Bishops did in 2010, which everybody in the room is probably familiar with. Um, 
the, I actually participated with this when I was in seminary, and I called every single parish in the archdiocese. I don't know if the clergy around here remember in 2010 some random seminarian calling them up on the phone, but I called every parish in the archdiocese um, to put together like a, 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 an amount of like people that were associated with our, our, our parishes. Um, and the number, when we added up all of the canonical jurisdictions, is 799,400 people. Um, Based on the methodology, probably an overcount. We can talk about that later, but whatever. That's the number. We'll take it as the number. Uh, historical data lacking. Uh, but I did recently find that the Christian Herald newspaper used to do censuses. Sensei? <laughs> Sorry. Back in the day. And uh, in the last one they did of the Orthodox Church was in 1947. And again, this was, again, the, you, you can quibble with the reporting, but they would call different churches and just kind of ask them how many people or how many congregants do you have. So the number when they did it the last time in 1947 was 702,273. Um, if you do the math, right, that is an increase of 13.8% over those 60 years, which it's not zero, right? So it's something, but I imagine a lot of our families probably like came to this country during the immigration waves of the 50s and 60s, for instance. Um, a lot of people also, like a lot of Orthodox people, married non-Orthodox people and brought them into the church that way, which is theoretically a doubling every time that happens, right? So despite you know, the reality of marriages, despite the reality of immigration, 60 years, 14%. But again, it's not zero, right? Well, if we look at the population of the United States during the course of that time, we grew 14%. The population more than doubled, which means we're like super losing ground. So 14% growth is misleading, super losing ground. Um, if the church is the body of Christ, it's bleeding. So why? I think there's a connection between disengaged youth and disengaged parents. I think there's, you know, and again, it, it's, it's a big picture issue because disengaged parents today, I think, are a commentary on the sort of youth ministry that formed them a generation ago when they were kids or a couple of decades ago. Also a commentary on the sort of, like, families that formed them a couple of de de decades ago. Um, not trying to be judgy, just trying to be honest. Uh, so disengaged parents will tend to pass on dis disengaged youth. You know, as, as, as Elisa actually said at a great talk she gave back in January, you know, like, and as many people have commented, you really can't pass on what you don't have, right? So if disengaged parents are raising disengaged youth who are going to grow up into disengaged parents, we're just going to see this cycle continue. And the thing is, we've had some duct tape in the church because of kind of our ethnic background that's been holding stuff together. Um, you know, like... Speaking for myself and my family, coming from a Greek background, there was just the cultural sort of expectation that you get married in the church even if you don't want to, right? The expectation that you baptize your kids in the church even if you don't want to. Because you, it's respectable, right? Like, you just, you're supposed to. That's breaking. I see it even in my family, for instance. One of my cousins actually recently made the decision not to get married in the church, and like lots of my other cousins, he doesn't believe, they didn't believe. He's the first one to actually sort of say, it doesn't matter to me. God bless him, actually. He has the integrity to say, I'm not going to dishonor the church by standing up there and saying something I don't believe. So I really respect that decision a lot. Um, but that, that, that cultural sort of like scotch tape that's been holding a lot of this together is fraying. We can't, can't, we can't count on kids to grow up and get married in the church but just because that's what people do. We can't count on kids baptizing their kids when they get older because that's what people do. You know, we, we can't count on sort of cultural inertia or other exogenous factors to keep sort of churning out new Christians. We're either going to be intentional about this or we're not. And if we're not, we're going to reap what we sow. So that's why I think this question of like the why is so important, Right. And it's frustrating to me as somebody who grew up in the church, and it's frustrating to me seeing the way that we sometimes do ministry, how we always lead with the what, right? And the people who are out there actually forming hearts, unfortunately, are forming consumerist hearts. Unfortunately, they're forming hearts that want to pay for products and pay for services and pay for shiny new things, right? Because they have a compelling vision of the world, because they have a compelling why, 
The nutty thing is, though, we have the most compelling why that exists, because we have the only true why. We have the why that motivated the Lord to lift everything out of non-existence and make all of this in the first place, right? We believe in a God who became one of us, who joined us in death, so we could join him, rise with him into eternal life. I don't care how many features the iPhone 10 has. That's got nothing on the kingdom, right? It's got nothing on the kingdom. Yet we so rarely lead with that. We so rarely lead with that. We give kids prayer books, and we don't even give them a reason to open them. We give kids gomboskinia, and there's a reason that gomboskinia live on wrists rather than hands. Because it's a what? It's a a bracelet. It's a decoration. It's not ultimately about connecting with the Lord. Because we don't talk about that. We don't talk about Jesus as if that's a Protestant thing. We don't talk about the scripture as if that's a Protestant thing. We're so concerned sometimes, and I'm on a rant now and I totally recognize it. We're so concerned sometimes with the, the formalism, right, of what we expect orthodoxy to look like that we are missing the point about what orthodoxy is about. It is about deification. It is about theosis. It is about union with the crucified and risen Lord. No one else can give kids that. No one else can give adults that. And if we remember why the hell we are here, if we remember why the hell we exist in the first place, if we remember what the gift is that is in our hands, if we remember that and can give that to people, I think we're going to bear better fruit. I think the conversation is going to shift if it's not simply about the external factors, right? But it starts, because the external factors are important. You've got to get to the what eventually, but you've got to start with why, you know? You've got to start with why. You've got to start with the love of God. You've got to start with the encounter. You have to start with the possibility of intimate connection with the Lord. (laughs) Otherwise, why the heck avoid meat for 40 days? It's stupid, it's boring. I like hamburgers, right? Otherwise, why wake up for church in the morning? It's stupid. It's boring. I don't understand what's going on. We've taken the gift of immortality and we've turned it into an oppressive obligation. Shame on us. But again, no judgment, right? No judgment. I think that's how we've been doing it for a long period of time. Let's take a deep breath. Let's remember why the heck we're here. Let's remember what comes first and put first things first. And start with why in our own lives and hopefully have a conversation about how we can reimagine ministry in our communities, in our families, and also in our own spiritual lives. Done. Thanks.